from Isaiah chapter 43, and I've asked Debbie if she would read that for us, and then uh, Psalm 126, Joy's going to read that, and then I have um, one from Philippians, and then one from the Gospel of John, and so I invite you to listen carefully and listen well, 
for this too is the word of the Lord. Um, you begin, Debbie, thank you. This is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea and passed through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former, <coughs> forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild anim animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland. To give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I form for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Thank you. Psalm? Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. Again from Philippians, uh, Paul's writing here. It says, um, If anyone thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for, whom, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. And then uh, from John chapter 12, Verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who he was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Um, this Sunday of Lent, you know, last week we stole some words from Alexander Schmemann, who said that Lent is a journey whose purpose is to transfer us from one spiritual state to the next. And so we were thinking about what's the, you know, what's the next step for us? Um, that helped give some shape to the larger framework we've been using as we move through Lent. This idea of a journey into the wilderness. The 40 days of Lent are patterned after Jesus' 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. And so we too walk this journey. Within that, there's a call. There's some progress that we see being made within us as we seek to... Um, um, take up our cross and follow Jesus as we seek to give up certain things in our lives that we might cling to or move towards so that we can have more of God and offer ourselves more fully to God. 
Um, so we see uh, we have a call, we see some progress, but we also face struggle and temptation. Uh, there, there are there are demons. There's the world, and there's some inner demons, perhaps, that we struggle with. Uh, but as we do that, as we continually give ourselves over and seek to do that more and more to God, the end result of that is a vision of God. Um, we get to see God face to face, which is our great hope, because Lent is sort of like a microcosm of our whole Christian life. And our end is to see him face to face. Um, and so uh, we have, we've taken this journey spiritually, call, progress, struggle, and vision, uh, from one spiritual stage to the next. And this morning, we're in the fifth Sunday in Lent. And that means we're almost, I mean, we're getting close to the end here. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's when we celebrate Jesus entering Jerusalem. And the palm branches being laid down in front of him. And the cloaks being taken off and placed before him. Um, singing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And yet, even in the midst of that celebratory note, there's also the awareness that this is Passion Week, which will start next Sunday and run throughout the rest of the week. Uh, it's, it's the week of Christ's suffering. And so we've got that bright sadness again. Remember? This atmosphere that's sort of coloring our whole experience. There's a bright light because we're aiming towards Easter and we see it on the horizon. And yet there's also the sadness of our present struggle in the world that has fallen. And so... After Palm Sunday and Passion Week comes Easter. So this is like our last, sort of like our last Sunday of Lent, where we have these consistent uh, themes running. Uh, the next two Sundays are pretty focused on their own. <clears throat> and so that's sort of where we've been. And this week, uh, I want us to sort of gather all this in and, and maybe take one final sort of preparatory step before we move into Palm Sunday and Holy Week. Um, so with that, let's go to the Lord once more in prayer. Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing unto you, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> so, when I was in Israel last year, which is sort of surreal to say, um, we got there, I flew into Tel Aviv, Votek picked us up at the airport. We drove up into the hill country, up to Jerusalem, dropped our bags at the hotel, waited for permission, got permission. That evening, first evening there, we got to go to the temple and to the southern wall of the temple, to the southern steps. And we can see there uh, big stones that have been placed there by Herod the Great. And we can see up to the top of the pit, what they call the pinnacle where uh, they would announce the arrival of the Sabbath day. And it's the place where, when the scriptures say Jesus was tempted, right, during his 40 days of Lent, the devil took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, cast yourself down from here. Does, don't the Psalms say, don't the scriptures say, that the Lord will not uh, allow you to strike your foot against a stone, but will send his angels concerning you to catch you up, right? So we went to that, to that place, to this spot, and we began to approach, and there were these pits um, where there was practiced the, the ritual of the, the mikvah, which was like a purification, a ritual bath of purification. As people would come to celebrate the feast, they would come first to this mikvah. Uh, it's sort of like a baptism of sorts. They would come, and they would dedicate and consecrate themselves to the Lord and seek to be washed clean as a sign of, of this renewed dedication to him. And once they passed through the, the mikvah, um, they began to climb the steps. And I, I told you about these steps before because they were of irregular size. It wasn't poor craftsmanship. It was so the kids wouldn't run around, right? I mean, it, if all the, all the steps are different sizes, you kind of have to pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, the kids, get, I'm sure they still did, but you, you couldn't just go crazy, right? And actually, as you began to climb the steps, you spent some time on each one because as you climbed, you would pray the Psalms of Ascent. As you ascended the steps of the temple, you would pray Psalm 119 through Psalm 134 in their entirety. 119 and 134. Joy read Psalm 126, right in the middle, right? So this is one of the Psalms that they would have prayed as they climbed the temple steps that I got to see. And they closed in some of the gates 
uh, that Jesus would have passed through, but you could see the remainder of them, the, the, the outside arch filled in with stones. And so he would have passed through these as people would go. They, they're purified, and then they climb the temple steps, meditating upon the scripture, and finally they go up and offer their sacrifice and receive then the opportunity to feast with God. That's what, that's what the feast was about, was feasting with God and with God's people. I don't know if you noticed this, but when we come into worship on a Sunday, we come and we remember our baptism. We confess that there is one baptism, and it's Christ's, and our baptism joins us to his, right? So we've been baptized once, but we continually come and offer prayers of confession, asking for forgiveness. Remember, I, I prayed that, that we sin against God, you know, uh, Word and deed, and so we need forgiveness. So we remember our baptism at the beginning. It's like we come in and we, we share in this mikvah almost, right? And then we come and we meditate upon the words of the Scripture. And then we go feast with God. Right? These patterns of worship we, we, have, we, have, we have taken up and gathered in, and they're consistent for us. And Psalm 126 kind of gathers in and represents for us all these Scriptures that we read this morning. So I want you to... I want you to notice it just very quickly. Psalm 126 has kind of two parts to it. And the first part um, speaks to the fact uh, that God has delivered the people. How does it begin? When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, that's like spiritual Jerusalem. We were like those who dream. Isn't that a great line? Just in and of itself. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. It was like in experiencing God's deliverance, it was, it was too good to be true. It was like something that wasn't real. It was like a dream. It was so beautiful. It says our mouths, they were filled with laughter. Our tongues loosed shouts of joy. The nations say, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord does, has done great things for us, and we are glad. It's a beautiful passage of God's deliverance. He's remembering when God did that, it was unbelievably good. We were unbelievably joyful. We were glad beyond anything that you could imagine. There's a remembrance there's a celebration as they're climbing again, again, the temple steps, right? Remember the context for it. And then the second part of the psalm is asking for God to do it again. It says, restore our fortunes, O Lord. Like streams in the Negev, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves, the, the harvest with him. Um, restore our fortunes, O God, like the streams of the Negev. Now, short, just outside of Jerusalem, just like on the other side of the hill, you go from this verdant place, lots of trees, lots of green, to like, it's like a hard line drawn in the sand, and it's desert. It's the craziest thing. Shocking when you see it. That's the Negev. That's the wilderness place. But there are streams of water there seasonally. In the spring, there are these wadis. That's what it's called. It's like a dry riverbed. In the spring, it rains, and they're suddenly filled with water and begin to flow. And plants grow up around these wadis in the midst of the wilderness, Animals then come and birds flock and animals are drawn to this source of water and there's life. And this happens year after year. And the people, they see the, the wilderness, they see the barrenness, they see no water, no life. And yet they know that in the spring, the Negev will flow once more and be marked with life. Just as God has acted in the midst of a barren and wilderness time and has brought forth life. So they have the expectation because God has acted before and they've seen it that God will act again, and they will experience it anew. And that just summarizes all these scripture readings. Isaiah, the passage Debbie read, Isaiah is noticing that Babylon 
uh, right? It conquers Israel. Yes. And so Isaiah looks back to the Exodus, looks back to when God has delivered them before, and notices and claims that God will do that again, even in the midst of another difficult time. The streams will flow in the Negev again. God will act once more, and we will be like those who dream. The psalm passage from 126 actually looks back to when God did act and restore the people uh, from Babylon's dominion. So God did do that, which Isaiah hoped for. And Psalm 126 looks back to that event and asks for God to deliver them again. Uh, the passage from um, uh, John chapter 12 is about this, you know, it's, we, we washed each other's feet on last Wednesday, right? Um, and in this passage, a woman comes and pours perfume on Jesus' feet and washes them with his hair or with her hair. Right? And there was, a, there was a little bit of awkwardness, right, in washing somebody else's feet. It's just a little, I mean, that's not something most of us do every day, you know. Um, a couple of people said, boy, I'm glad I got a pedicure the other day, right? So at least somewhat used to somebody touching their feet. But for most of us, right, that's not a common occurrence. It's a little bit unusual. Can you imagine the midst of supper? This woman coming with perfume and pouring this perfume on Jesus' feet? And wiping it with her hair? I mean, what do you talk about while that's going on, right? Um, it's strange, yeah? And yet Jesus receives this action, and that story at the center is framed, beginning and end, with an account of where it took place, because this is super important. Just as 126 makes a lot more sense, if you know it happens on the steps of the temple, where did this take place? Did you catch that? In Bethany, which was out, just outside of Jerusalem. In the home of Lazarus. And there was that little almost throwaway line, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Just slip that in there, right? <laughs> this took place in the home of Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. There's a remembrance of Christ's action what he has done, there's a celebration of that in the worship the woman offers because she is not just, this isn't just Jesus who has yet to do anything. No, this is Jesus who has raised a man from the dead, demonstrating his victory over death. And at the end of the passage, Jesus says, you won't always have me. Let her do this. Let her worship in this way. You won't always have me in the way that you have me now. Let her keep the rest of this perfume for my what? my burial. The story is framed by Christ's victory over death, his action in the past, but it also provides hope for his future action moving forward, right? Remembering what Christ has done, celebrating it in the midst of time, fills you with hope for what God will yet do and confidence in his ability to act. That's what Paul is talking about. He gathers all this up in Philippians. In Philippians, he says, I'm forgetting everything which lay in the past. Everything I've done. Right? He says, I'm a Hebrew. The Hebrews, like a good Hebrew kid, Hebrew kid, I was circumcised on the eighth day. As to the law, as the keeping of the legal requirement of the law, I'm faultless. Um, he's a Pharisee. The Pharisee He's memorized nearly the entire Old Testament, if not all of it. He was trained under like the preeminent scholar of the day. Like his resume is impeccable for him. But he says, when it comes to Jesus, I've decided that, like, I don't care about all that anymore in comparison. But I put all my hope in Christ, the one who was crucified for my sake, the one who was raised from the dead, the one who offers new life, the one who met me on the road to Damascus and blinded me with his light, with the brightness that I couldn't bear, and yet who also brought healing to my eyes through the prayers of another Christian that I was going to persecute, he turned my world upside down. And so I don't count, he, he actually, this word for refuse is, uh, we have an expression that we might use for that, it, but it wasn't, it wasn't worth who. That's what that word means. All right? And so he says, I'm just counting that as worthless. 
And I seek to know Jesus so that I can come to share in his resurrection. See that future, future hope, right? He remembers what Christ has done in the past. And he celebrates that in the present. And he seeks to participate it in it in the present, that I can share in his sufferings, that I can share in his life for the sake of a future hope. And that is what Lent is doing for us. We look back to what Jesus has done and we worship him in the present. And that builds us up, that, that strengthens our hope for what Christ will do, yet do in the future. And so I thought, how can, you know, this week, here's my challenge to you. Here's my invitation to you. I want you to make a list of the things that God has done in your life. And we could do that as a group, and our session is going to do that this afternoon and give thanks. But I want you to write down five things, maybe more. What Jesus has done in your life, remember them. And then celebrate them. Give thanks to God for them and allow that to strengthen you as you look to the future and hope. You know, hey, it's been a rough go of it for a while. We've been in a wilderness of sorts, right? And yet, our hope isn't in our own strength or what we can do or making the best decisions. Our hope is in what Christ has done, our present worship and celebration of that, and the hope that we have in him for, he, for what he will yet do. I made a note of a few things from this past week. See, the cool thing about what I get to do is I get to know all these wonderful things that happen in people's lives. Right? So some folks who ran out of money were given some. It showed up. It appeared right when they needed it. They gave thanks. God's acted in their life, and now that builds them up in hope for the future. They celebrate. Lois Johnson was standing over here, and after we finished carrying out this activity on Wednesday, we just had a moment where we could reflect a little bit, and she was brought to tears, giving thanks for what Jesus has done in her life, for the forgiveness of her sin, for the adoption uh, of her as a daughter of the king. She recognized what Jesus had done. She gave thanks for it in the present, and that builds us up in hope as we move into the future. Um, there are three sets of expected parents in this room this morning, and we can give thanks for what God has done, and we can celebrate that, and we can hope for the future. Uh, Lib Green's son, Paul, came. He's having some pretty bad heart trouble. Um, months ago, first trip to Newland, he comes and he makes like gallons and gallons of food for Lib and puts it in the fr uh, freezer. So all she has to do is go out and get some food and eat it, which is great. And then he makes these deliveries to our house. But we give thanks for God's deliverance of Paul and what he's doing in the present. We celebrate the chili and we look forward to the future. But at the same time, guess what happened while Paul was here? After not being here for months and months, he usually comes, you know, every few weeks. Lib's car broke down while he was here so that he could be present and is taking care of the car situation. And he said, that's not an accident. Remember what God's done in the past, how God has acted, celebrate it, and that gives us hope for the future. Um, Judy Marshall has cancer. We've been praying for her. Pancreatic cancer. And she's looking back and giving thanks that they found it early. Right? That's not usually the case with that form of cancer. And so she is going for treatment this coming week, starting chemotherapy. And she's looking back, of course, at all the places in her life where God has acted. And she's celebrating that. And that gives her hope. Um, Lou Cooper's birthday was this past week. And she has health challenges. And yet we together were able to Give thanks for God's work in her life and her family. Uh, you know, we have this session retreat coming up. Anybody else want to throw something out there? I mean, something good happened this week? This is a two-way conversation, or three. Yeah. I, I yeah. got to see my sister for the first time in a year and a half unexpectedly. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks be to God. Yeah, we can, we can remember together. We can celebrate that. And that builds us up in hope for the future. That's, that's what Lent's about. 
That could be your homework assignment this week. Um, so that together next week, we can maybe open that up and maybe you've got one or two things you can share moving forward. It's grateful that when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Our tongues loose shouts of joy. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When you come to the temple, you remember your baptism. You spend time in God's Word, and you continue to climb and to ascend. And at the top, then, uh, there is a feast available. There's a sacrifice which we offer up in the form of an offering. And there's also the Lord who meets us and takes our ordinary materials of this world and our ordinary lives and takes ordinary bread and an ordinary cup and by the Spirit transforms that into communion with Him. And so that's what happens at this table. Uh, and so I invite you to come this day with grateful hearts, lifting your hearts up to the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord our God, for it indeed is right to give God thanks and praise. Uh, we come remembering that Christ has died and Christ has risen and that Christ will come again. See how that uh, ties in neatly with remembering the past and recognizing that Christ is alive and present and hoping as we look to the future for Christ's return. So as we come to this table, I invite you to come grateful and hopeful. And let us come in prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we give you thanks uh, for your great love for us. And we give you thanks that um, you spoke and the world came to be. And you spoke again and created us in your image to share in relationship with you, uh, to be stewards of your creation, to participate in your life and in the life of the world, and to gather up the whole world and to offer it to you in praise. Lord, we thank you that when we turn from you, even in the garden and even in our own lives, that you did not turn from us, but that you were a God who continues to pursue us, calling out, uh, where are you, that we might be drawn to you once more, um, encouraging us to answer, as Moses did at the bush, here I am. Lord, we thank you for the covenants that you have made and the promises that you have made to us and to your people and to the world. Covenants with Adam and Eve and Noah and Moses and Abraham and David. Um, we thank you for the fulfillment of all those covenants in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. And that when the fullness of time had come, you sent your eternal word to take on flesh and to dwell among us full of grace and truth. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are for us the way, the truth, and the life. And that we can come to the Father through you and by your spirit. So we pray, Lord Jesus, as we approach um, this Lenten season, as we approach our celebration of Easter, as we draw near to Palm Sunday and your Passion Week, uh, we pray that you would join us to yourself, that you would gather us in as your people, as your body, and make us one with you. So we pray that you would once more send your spirit upon us, and upon these gifts of bread and wine, the bread we break and the cup we bless, we truly be in communion with you, Lord Jesus. Make us one with yourself. Make us one with all those who have been baptized into your name, that we might be one in worship and in ministry together. Lord, we come offering to you not only our own lives in this congregation, um, but even the world, mindful that as we look out upon the world, we can see brightness in so many places, such incredible beauty, and yet we also are struck by the sadness of the suffering we see. Lord, may we offer all of this up to you, the one who has promised to set it right, uh, even as we offer up this prayer that you have taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now the words of the institution of the Holy Feast of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the night of his arrest, Jesus, after washing feet, uh, said to his disciples who ate there with him, uh, he took bread, he gave thanks for it, and he broke it, and he said to them, this is my body broken for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. So now every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, this morning, we will, um, I'll, I'll invite you to come forward to receive communion, and I will have uh, the plate with bread on one side, and I'll invite you to take a piece, and then I'll have the plate with, with the cups on the other. I invite you to come forward to receive, and you can maybe go back to your seat by the, the outside aisle, come forward by the center. Um, I want you to come. Those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, come taste and see, indeed, that he is good. When, when you remember, celebrate, and hope, you'll notice that you start noticing a little better. Um, worship, in some shorthand way, can be described as attention and sacrifice. A sacrifice of attending to other things and attending to God. And when you remember on purpose and you celebrate on purpose and you begin to grow in hope on purpose, you'll begin to pay attention to God acting in the present more fully. And you'll have these little glimpses that sometimes will catch you by surprise of the fullness of time. Of all of who God is coming and filling a present moment. Sometimes, yes, in surprising ways. See if that might not also happen this week as you do homework, right? It's for a larger purpose, that you would meet God, who is with you in every place that you go and every time that you are. So as you go to that work and toward that hope, I pray that the hands of Christ would tend your wounds, that you bring to mind just the things that you need to hear. You would rest assured that the Father will raise you up into his everlasting arms at the last.